And if everything is in order, meaning there is compliance with the law, the SEC issues the Certificate of Registration. <clears throat> and upon issuance of the Certificate of Registration, in the eyes of the law, there will be a new person, and that is the corporation. <clears throat> okay? All right, uh, but for your info, uh, for your information, uh, if let us say you filed your documents with the SEC last May 15, and let us say it will only be tomorrow that they'll be issuing the certificate of registration, don't be surprised to see that the date in the certificate of registration is not the date tomorrow, but May 15. The certificate of registration is dated uh, on the day the documents are filed with the SEC. So again, if the documents were filed last May 15, then what shall appear in the certificate of registration is the date of filing, not the date of the actual preparation of the certificate of registration. <coughs> All right. Uh, Upon issuance of the certificate of registration, there is a new person, and that is the person of the corporation. Okay? All right. Now, uh, a corporation as a person can acquire properties exclusively in its own name. And properties acquired by a corporation exclusively in its own name belong only to the corporation. The stockholders or members cannot say that they are part owners or co-owners of those properties, unlike in the case of a partnership. In a partnership, although a property is registered in the name of, a part of the partnership, actually the partners are co-owners of those properties. There's another difference between a partnership and a corporation. In a corporation, if a property is registered in the name of the corporation, the owner of that property is only the corporation. But if it is a partnership that owns the property, although the property is registered in the name of the partnership, the partners can say they are co-owners of that property. Okay? Although it's just in the name of the partnership. <clears throat> okay? All right. A corporation can enter into contracts exclusively in its own name. And these contracts are contracts of the corporation. So if the other party violates that contract and the corporation decides to sue the other party, the action shall be only in the name of of the corporation. It shall not be in the name of the president or any director of the corporation. Contracts entered into by a corporation are contracts of that corporation only and of no one else. On the other hand, if it is the corporation that violates the contract, the other party sues only the corporation and not the person who signed on behalf of the corporation. Okay? Alright, so generally stated, uh, liabilities of a corporation, uh, liabilities incurred by the corporation, are liabilities of the corporation. And if a party would like to see the corporation to enforce these liabilities, the other party sues only that corporation and no one else. <clears throat> Reason is, a corporation has a personality of its own, separate and distinct from the personality of its organizers, separate and distinct from the personality of the directors or officers. That's the general rule. And there are exceptions. And there is an exception. The exception being when it is proper to pierce the corporate veil. Uh, 
Veil. Spelled as V-E-I-L. Okay? Not vain. Baka sabihin nyo, yung vain para yung sa addict, nagtuturok pa. Okay? No. Veil. Reason is, if this is the corporation, these are the organizers of the corporation, legally, between them is a veil. That which separates their respective personality. So, piercing the corporate veil in common man's expression is simply disregarding the separate personality of the corporation, making its liabilities, the liabilities of certain persons behind the corporation. Now, what I would like to stress about piercing the corporate veil is um, it is not based on law. Uh, it's not based on a provision of law. It's based on jurisprudence. <clears throat> and uh, what had been the pronouncements of the Supreme Court concerning piercing the corporate veil? Right. One pronouncement is, and this, this had been frequently made by the Supreme Court, not because a person has controlling interest in the corporation, would it always follow that in case of insolvency, that person or the controlling stockholder would be obliged to pay? And that had been frequently stated by the Supreme Court. In fact, if you're going to look at recent rulings of the Supreme Court, uh, that is the most frequently cited pronouncement of its earlier rulings. Not because a person has controlling interest in the corporation would it always mean that in case of insolvency the controlling stockholder would be obliged to pay. All right. Another pronouncement of the Supreme Court about piercing the corporate veil is uh, the separate personality of a corporation may be set aside only when there is clear and convincing evidence that the corporation was organized purposely to commit tax evasion or to defeat public convenience or to commit a legal wrong. <clears throat> uh, when there is clear and convincing evidence that the corporation was organized purposely to commit tax evasion, to defeat public convenience, or to commit a legal wrong. Or, there is clear and convincing evidence that the corporation is merely an alter ego of the controlling stockholder. When there is clear and convincing evidence that the corporation is merely the alter ego of the controlling stockholder. Next is, when there is clear and convincing evidence that of two corporations, one may be considered a mere instrumentality of the other. <clears throat> When of two corporations, there is clear and convincing evidence that one is merely the instrumentality of the other. <clears throat> okay. Now you may ask, how do we reconcile the first one and the third one? The first one is that not because a person has controlling interest in the corporation would it always mean that in case of insolvency, the controlling stockholder would be obliged to pay. And the third one says, when there is clear and convincing evidence that the corporation is merely an alter ego of the controlling stockholder. Okay. Uh, in the first case, the, the controlling stockholder was able to prove uh, Controlling stockholder was able to prove that he did not make decisions alone. That decisions in that corporation, although he was controlling stockholder, were made by the board of directors. 
Okay? And he was able to prove it. He presented during the trial minutes of the meetings of the board showing uh, how the decisions were arrived at. But then in the third case, uh, where the corporation is a mere alter ego of the controlling stockholder, the evidence, shows, uh, the evidence showed that decisions in that corporation were made only by the controlling stockholder. There were no meetings of the board. Okay? So the, the Supreme Court said, well, in that case, as you were making the decision by yourself, no meetings of the board, you are the controlling stockholder, then it may be said that the corporation is just your alter ego. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Now about the instrumentality rule. The facts of that case went this way. There was a pipe manufacturing corporation. Okay, that corporation was producing big the big concrete pipes used for land development or road building. Uh, usually used for drainage. Okay. Now this pipe manufacturing corporation organized a subsidiary. And the subsidiary was to engage in construction. The name of the subsidiary was Concept Builders Incorporated. And I'll just refer to it as CBI. <clears throat> CBI incurred a lot of liabilities towards its laborers. Laborers sued CBI. They got a favorable judgment. But when they were enforcing the judgment, they could not find any property belonging to CBI. So what the laborers did was to cause a levy on the assets of the Pipe Manufacturing Corporation, which that corporation resisted, contending that it has a personality of its own, separate and distinct from the personality of CBI. In short, the issue reached the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found out that CBI is merely an in, uh, a subsidiary of the Pipe Manufacturing Corporation. <clears throat> but then, that alone would not have justified piercing the corporate veil. But the Supreme Court also found out that the directors of both corporations, meaning the Pipe Manufacturing and CBI, uh, were exactly the same persons. Now, that alone also would not have justified disregarding the separate personalities of these corporations. But then the Supreme Court also found out that except for one, their officers were identical. Okay? All right, but that alone also would not have justified disregarding separate personalities of this corporation, of these corporations. And one more finding of the Supreme Court was they shared the same principal office. So taken together, uh, take, taking, taking into consideration all these findings, the Supreme Court said that they were managed by the same persons. Then it may be said that CBI did not have a mind of its own and may just be considered a mere instrumentality of the Pipe Manufacturing Corporation. Okay? So, yeah, actually, it, it was in that case that this uh, instrumentality rule came out in the case of Concept Builders Incorporated. <coughs> okay? <coughs> All right. Now, let's talk of the other document connected with Incorp uh, with the incorporation process, the bylaws of the corporation. <clears throat> the bylaws of the corporation is its set uh, of house rules. Okay, so bylaws, also known as house rules of the corporation. Okay, uh, it may be filed together with the articles, in which case. It is required that all the incorporators sign the bylaws. 
But if the bylaws would be filed after issuance of the certificate of registration, then it's enough that it be signed by a majority of the incorporators. So there is a difference uh, when it comes to requirement about signatures. Okay? When the bylaws would be filed together with the articles, all the incorporators must sign. But if the bylaws would be filed after issuance of the certificate of registration, then it should be signed by at least a majority of the incorporators. And when should it be filed after issuance of the certificate of registration? Within 30 days from issuance of the certificate of registration. <clears throat> Within 30 days from issuance of the certificate of registration. If not, there is the danger of the cancellation of the certificate of registration. By the way, I have for your info, when a corporation fails to file the bylaws within this 30-day period, the cancellation of the certificate of registration is not automatic. Okay? The Supreme Court has already made a pronouncement on this issue. That mere failure to file the bylaws within 30 days from issuance of the certificate of registration won't automatically mean the cancellation of its certificate of registration. And the justification of the Supreme Court is the due process clause of the Constitution. That no person shall be deprived of life without due process of law. So in practice, what the SEC does, if the certificate of registration is not filed within the period, before it cancels the certificate of registration, SEC sends the corporation a show cause notice. A show cause notice. Directing the corporation to explain why its certificate of registration should not be cancelled on account of its failure to file the bylaws within that period. And if the corporation can explain SEC won't cancel the certificate of registration, but perhaps, depending on the explanation, may just impose an administrative fine or penalty for late filing. Okay? All right, so what are the matters required to be stated in the bylaws? The matters required to be stated in the bylaws are all about meetings of the stockholders or members. Number two is all about directors. Next is all about officers of the corporation. Also, uh, the stock and transfer, uh, the stock certificates in case of stock corporations and whether the corporation be stock or non-stock, uh, ma the, the matter about the corporate seal and if the stockholders or members would like to have a provision about amendments, uh, rules about amendments of the articles, as well as of the bylaws. If there is nothing in the bylaws about how to amend the articles or bylaws, then just comply with what the corporation code provides. Uh, we already have rules about amendments in the law itself, but if the stockholders or members would like to vary what the law provides, then they may do so in the bylaws. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Now, let's talk about the rules concerning meetings in a corporation. Every corporation has an annual meeting. And the annual meeting is also known as the regular meeting. 
So these two uh, may be used interchangeably in corporations. Regular meeting or annual meeting, uh, they refer to the same meeting. A corporation has only an annual meeting, and that is its regular meeting. Okay? All right. The bylaws states the day and time of the annual meeting. Okay? The day, the bylaws states the day and time of the annual meeting. Now you may ask, what about the place? Well, the, if the corporation has a few stockholders or members, the meeting could be held in, in the principal office of the corporation. Let us say there are only 10 stockholders of the corporation or 10 members. Perhaps uh, that little corner would be sufficient for their number. Okay? 10 people. You don't need a big space for them. Okay? So perhaps a little space would be good enough for the annual meeting of the 10 members or 10 stockholders of the corporation. But if you have a corporation that is publicly listed, which may perhaps have thousands of stockholders, certainly, no corporation would have a conference room big enough for a thousand stockholders or members. And I give you an example, actual example. This was published in the papers, uh, I think, a year ago. Uh, Miralco. Uh, as published, Miralco has 87,000 stockholders. 87,000 stockholders. All right. Forget 87,000. Just take 10% of that. That's 8,700. Okay. Miralco has its own theater. Okay. Uh, right beside its principal office. But then, its theater cannot accommodate even 2,000 uh, persons. Uh, I am not aware of any theater that could accommodate even 1,000 uh, viewers at any time. Okay? And Miralco has 87,000 stockholders. All right. That's why in that annual meeting of Miralco, the general manager of GSIS, Winston Garcia, complained that he was not allowed inside Miralco to attend the annual meeting of the stockholders. Actually, he was not allowed. It, th there is no truth that he was not allowed. Uh, it was just that when he attend, when he arrived to attend the meeting, uh, the place was already filled up with the other stockholders of Miralco. So no more space for him to get inside. Why? The theater could not accommodate even a thousand persons. So it, when he arrived late, uh, the stockholders of Miralco were already there. Uh, every, every square, every square uh, foot occupied by one person. Uh, in short, uh, full pack. So by the time he arrived, no more space for him. Right? But then it was not true that he was excluded. No. Uh, it was just that there was not enough space for him to get in because the other stockholders arrived way ahead of him. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So what's the rule? If the principal of the, of the corporation is not big enough to accommodate all the stockholders or members, as the law provides, the meeting may be held uh, in any other place, in the city or municipality where the corporation has its principal office. So again, if the principal office of the corporation is not big enough for all the stockholders or members, the meeting may be held elsewhere in the city or municipality where the corporation has its principal office. <clears throat> All right. Um, usually, 
Now, usually during the month of April and May, uh, you'll see in the newspapers uh, box notices stating the details of the annual meeting of certain corporations. Okay? And the notices state the venue of the meeting as in a ballroom of a hotel. Okay? Now, big, uh, best example, uh, Manila Bulletin. When Manila Bulletin uh, holds its stockholders meeting, okay, it comes out it comes out with a notice in Manila Bulletin that the annual meeting shall be in the grand ballroom of the Manila Hotel. All right, the grand ballroom of the Manila Hotel. I think has or can accommodate up to as many as five thousand persons. So that many. Okay? All right. And it is just an annual meeting. No dancing. Just a meeting. Okay? And that many persons attending. Reason is, Manila Bulletin is a publicly listed corporation. So it has a lot of stockholders. Could be numbering thousands. But then that's, not the, that's, it. that's not the only publicly listed corporation. There are many others. That's why from time to time, uh, you read in these newspapers, these box notices, that the meeting shall be held uh, in a ballroom of a big hotel. Okay? And if the ballroom of a hotel is not big enough, perhaps they might even have to use the PICC. Because after all, the PICC was intended for meetings of big groups. And if that won't be big enough, perhaps they might have to talk to the mayor of the city of Manila to use the Quirino Grandstand. And if that be not big enough, they might have to talk with uh, Mike Velarde uh, to use the grounds of the El Shaddai. Okay? So depending on how big the number of stockholders or members that would have to attend the meeting. Okay? All right. Now, this is on the practical side. When the day comes that you would be consulted on what to state as the date of the annual meeting, <clears throat> usually, <clears throat> usually, annual meetings are held after the audited financial statements are ready so that the president uh, would have something to report to the stockholders uh, based on findings of the auditor of the corporation. Okay? But in setting the date of the annual meeting, don't say that the annual meeting shall be on April 2 or March 10 or any other similar days. Why? Because if you're going to fix a date like March 2 or April 10, there is a possibility that that day would fall on a Saturday or Sunday. On which days nobody uh, would want to attend a meeting. Okay? So, when you suggest a date for the annual meeting, uh, don't suggest a definite day, but what you say is the annual meeting shall be on the second Tuesday of March or the third Wednesday of April. If you're going to say second Tuesday of March, certainly that will be a Tuesday. It will never be a Saturday or Sunday. Okay? Very much like why some people are wondering that Good Friday is always on a Friday. Sabi ni ba, bakit ba yung Biyernes Santo laging Biyernes? It never fell on any other day. Because if you would allow it to fall on another day, let's say on a Wednesday, then it won't anymore be Good Friday, but Good Wednesday. Okay? 
right? And uh, well, the church has its own calendar. Okay. All right. So that's how we do it uh, on the practical side. All right. Now, uh, in every meeting, uh, whether it be regular or special, there must be a quorum. Without a quorum at the start of the meeting, the meeting should be adjourned. Okay? In every meeting of the stockholders or members, there must be a quorum at the start of the meeting. All right. And what is the quorum in a meeting of stockholders? Quorum in a meeting of the stockholders is the presence in person or by proxy. Quorum in a meeting of stockholders is the presence in person or by proxy of the stockholder, even just one, or stockholders representing the majority of the outstanding shares. Again, quorum in a meeting of the stockholders. And, all right, this rule applies only to stock corporation. Huh? Quorum in a meeting of the stockholders, whether regular or special, shall be the presence of, in person or by proxy, of the stockholder, even just one, or stockholders representing the majority of the outstanding shares. <clears throat> okay. Now, just for illustration, let us say we are all stockholders of a corporation. Okay? And uh, there are, let us say, 400 of you. Okay? And these 400 own the combined interest of 49%. All of you, numbering 400, you own the combined 49%. And I alone own 51%. Okay? So all of you numbering 400, you own 49%, but I alone own 51%. And a meeting is to start now. All of you are present. I'm still out. I have not arrived. I have not sent a proxy. Question is, may you validly proceed with your meeting? No. Why? No quorum. Okay? All right. Now, let's reverse the scenario. Only I am present. All of you are out. Question. May the meeting validly proceed? Yes. Because there is a quorum. So, even if I am alone, alone, uh, I will have a meeting by myself. Okay? And will that meeting be valid? Yes. Because at the start of the meeting, there is a quorum. Got it? <clears throat> okay. Now, the law says that quorum is the presence of the stockholder or stockholders in person or by proxy representing the majority of the outstanding shares. So, what's important is you know the meaning of outstanding shares. So, what is or how is outstanding shares defined in the law? Outstanding shares are those issued. Those issued by the corporation excluding treasury shares. Outstanding shares are all issued, 
excluding treasury shares. <clears throat> and uh, what, should, what is your understanding of treasury shares? Treasury shares are those shares already issued by the corporation, but which later on the corporation reacquires through any legal means. Outstanding shares refer to those already issued by the corporation, but which shares the corporation later on reacquires through any legal means. Okay? Do you understand those statements? Ah, sige, let's see if you understand them. 